Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the course BC310, Church and Ministry Administration. I see all your notes in the chat. Good morning, everybody. And mm, it's getting cool in Mumbai as well. Yeah, it's getting cool here in Bangalore. And uh, uh, cool in Mumbai. Okay, let's take a moment to pray. And then we will start. Anybody could lead us in prayer, please. Go ahead, Ashan. Thank you. Dear God, thank you so much for your loving kindness and for this day and breath in our lungs. And thank you, Lord, for everything that you're about to do, Lord, that as we're about to learn the book of CMA, Lord, that we may understand and grasp the truths that you have spoken, Lord, that we may grow in wisdom and knowledge. And I pray that we pour out your spirit and pass out Shri Jesus' teaching, Lord, that we may, Lord, that you give him the words to uh, explain whatever we have, Lord, and clear our doubts, God. Thank you, Lord, for everything, and bless each one of them, and us. that today will be a blessed day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, once again. So we have been um, talking, spending some time on culture, uh, <clears throat> organizational culture and also kind of extending it to church culture. Um, now, I know that uh, at the end of uh, the last class, we kind of paused. Um, there were a couple of questions. Uh, I think there was one question from Abraham, which we needed to answer, but I'm not seeing Abraham the class yet. I think he will be joining us. So, yeah, we'll just wait on that question. Uh, until he comes in and others come in. Uh, we will go forward. Oh, there's Abraham. Just joined. Okay. All right. So um, the uh, let me just quickly review what we covered, and then I'll pick up Abraham's question. So we were talking about culture. We've been on it a little bit. Uh, hopefully, I'll finish it this hour and move on to two other topics today. Here to talk about finance, managing finance, and then talk a little bit, a short note on legal side of the administration. So hopefully, we we'll cover those things today. So we've been talking about culture, the importance of culture. We spend a lot of time talking about what shapes the culture within the organization. And then, of course, it extends into the <clears throat> congregation in the church setting or into uh, the whole group of volunteers and others who are serving uh, in a Christian ministry. Uh, I shared about our core values at APC and uh, the importance of writing it down. And you know, then from top down, in everything we do, we show, we demonstrate that. This is how we to work and you know, we have to constantly keep um, reminding people constantly keep you know doing it then people will begin to themselves model it in all uh, all levels across the organization we yeah so that's where we stopped and then there were a lot of questions um, we will uh, I'll just uh, quickly answer Abraham's question that he had uh, Abraham had uh, uh, mentioned towards the end of last class. So Abraham's question was, um, uh, how do we bridge the divide between uh, ages? You know, there, there are elders, there are youth, and so on. And how do we, you know, keep keep everybody together? Like we said, unity is one of our important core values. That means we want everybody, regardless of age, regardless of cultural background, language background, whatever. If you're part of this community, then we want everybody to be in unison, keep people together. So Abraham, um, Abraham, that was a challenge that we also faced. And I think it's something that we always look out for, which is the, we don't want people, you know, the older to feel separate from the younger, the youth. So uh, it, it became a big problem, a big noticeable divide in our church congregation. 
uh, I, I think this was around um, 2010, 11, you know, 10 years into this, our journey, uh, somewhere around that time, or maybe even before, but we began to address it at that time. So we kind of noticed it a little earlier, saying, um, you know, it seemed like there were two churches in one church or two congregations in one church. There were the older people and then the youth and, you know, they were like just separate. They never really mingled. And that was a big problem. We did, we definitely, did, definitely did not want that kind of thing happening in the congregation. So what we started doing, uh, I think, like I said, from 2010, thereabouts, and I forget the exact year, what we started doing, we started intentionally, uh, we started um, intentionally doing things that would bring people together of all ages. So we said we will have what was called as family Sundays. And we had it like, a, I think about three times a year. And in these family Sundays, uh, we would it was hit, it would happen on a Sunday after service. There would be lunch, of course, and then there would be activities where everybody would we would request people to stay back and do activities together, like games and things like that, where everybody would play together. And the, it was done intentionally because we wanted you know older people, younger people, just to get to know each other, you know, connect with each other, and so on. So that's one thing we started, you know, intentionally building bridges. Then in other areas of ministry, we again started bringing people together of, across ages. So when we went on mission trips, uh, we would have mission teams, which would have, of course, once a year there was an exclusive youth mission trip, which was all the youth. But on other mission trips, we would mix the people. That means have older people and younger people go together on mission trips and serve together. Um, so we uh, <clears throat> started doing that as well. Yeah, so uh, intentionally, so these are two main things that I can think of right now, the family Sundays and this, and then also engaging people of all ages in thing activities every Sunday in church. Like, you know, uh, example where, where older people don't, elder people, they don't need to, you know, uh, do very hard work. Example like ushering, greeting, um, book table. Uh, in 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 these areas, you know, you could have older people, younger people, youth working together, and they can do it together. You know, uh, some more heavy things like sound and setup, where to carry heavy things. You know, of course, it's mainly youth who are doing it. Uh, but in other areas, uh, where old elders and younger people can do things together. So on Sundays, we would intentionally, you know, mix people. So they will all work together. So that way, uh, it really helped bring closeness and, uh, you know, uh, to prevent this divide. Because of course, younger people can learn from the experience and the knowledge of the older people. And uh, the older ones can, you know, be supported by the strength and the energy of the youth, you know. So both stand to benefit uh, when they are doing things together. So that's how we try to address it. And 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 it's, it's ongoing, you know. It's not like uh, you do it one year and then you stop. No, we have to keep on, continue like that. And we are trying to do that now as well, you know, try to continue like that where, you know, to do things where people come together and uh, intentionally working together. So they begin to appreciate, understand each other. I hope that helps, Abra. All right. Yes, Pastor, thank you so much, Pastor. Thank you. Welcome. So, you're welcome. So let's move forward in our uh, lesson on culture and just try to finish that. Um, so it, within the organization, uh, you know, we need to, understand what is healthy culture working inside the organization and what is toxic culture that means bad this is unhealthy it is not good it can harm people it can hurt people and of course it will usually end up destroying the organization itself if it is not uh, corrected 
And we must be clear in our minds, you know, the difference between a healthy workplace, a healthy organizational culture, and a toxic culture, and even in a Christian context. And, uh, you know, if, if you've been reading some of the articles, you know, coming out on Christianity today, and I, I don't think this is just new, but it's, it's becoming more visible. You know, uh, the, the, you will see articles on churches or Christian ministries, individuals where, you know, really they, they actually tolerated some amount or sometimes to a bad degree toxic culture in Christian churches, Christian organizations, and people were hurt, but then nobody said anything because, you know, who's supposed to, who, who's going to question a spiritual leader or spiritual leadership, you know, so people just keep quiet and they tolerate it, but people are getting hurt. And now, you know, people are beginning to speak up and say, look, that should not be happening, you know. So this table is just a, a little contrast here, just so that we understand this is good, this is not good, and we should avoid this. So look at the healthy culture, toxic. A healthy culture uh, and among the leaders and among the staff, people are working. Uh, it should be consultative, meaning let's discuss, rather than dictatorial, saying, do what I say. It's encouraging and supportive rather than abusive, overpowering, suppressive, suffocating. People feel, you know, I'm just being controlled. I'm like a puppet. Teamwork is encouraged. Uh, in a toxic culture, there's unhealthy competition between people or between teams or between leaders. Uh, Conversation, communication is simple, direct, straightforward. In a toxic culture, it's manipulative. Uh, there's a sense of freedom in a healthy culture. There's a sense of being controlled. Uh, there's a sense that the leadership is transparent, honest, uh, telling us what we need to, you know, telling us the things as they are, things that we need to know. Uh, in a toxic culture, everything is secretive. Nobody knows what's going on uh, other than maybe the leader and a few people in the leadership. In a healthy culture, the shared success, it means we, you know, uh, uh, the wins and the wins are shared. It's not like, oh, the leader gets all the glory. But in a toxic culture, it's a celebrity culture where the leader or the leadership is considered superstars and I am the brand, you know. In other words, it's almost like everything exists because of me. And, uh, you know, that's kind of a toxic situation. In a healthy culture, it's there's celebration of togetherness. You know, we did it together. It's all. Of, it's about all of us. We did it together. In a toxic culture, it's it's all because of me. In a healthy culture, there's fairness. Everyone is rewarded based on you know on, on the same criteria, based on perform. There's no partiality, so on. In a, a toxic culture, people feel entitled. You know, it's my right. I deserve this. I I need more than the other person, etc. You know. There's that entitlement. Um, among the leadership, there is accountability. I'm answerable to others. Uh, in a toxic culture, it's autocratic. No accountability. I don't answer to anybody. Um, uh, in a healthy culture, we celebrate each other's strengths. Uh, in, in a toxic culture, you know, there's a sense of I'm better than you. I know more than you. You have to listen to me. And that's something we have to guard against. There is walking in mutual submission. There are leaders, but leaders also submit to one another and are walking in humility. Uh, everybody follows the same rules. Uh, 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 in a toxic culture, the leader or the leadership say, you know, I or we are above the rules. Everybody else follows, we are not. The rules don't apply to us. So when you see things like this here on the right hand side, then it's an indicator that the leadership is toxic. You know, so the problem is with the leadership. And of course, it'll all get into the organization and uh, it will hurt people, right? So this has to be addressed. Among people, among the staff, if you want to compare, um, a, in a healthy organizational culture, you know, people have the mindset, I give my best, I'm passionate about my work. I hear this, oh, I must just do a job. You know, uh, People are looking at excellence, I must do outstanding work. They're in a toxic culture. It's like, man, I just need to be here nine to five. I, that's it, you know. Uh, and then even among the staff, uh, there's the sense of we must succeed and we must help each other to succeed. In a toxic culture, it's like, I do my job. I don't care about what others do. That's it. So the, again, these are all symptoms, signs that things are not good among the people who are 
in the organization right so uh, as leaders as people working we, we need to keep them you know be alert hey if i see this kind of thing i need to deal with it now if you want to put it here you know in terms of uh, contrasting words you can see you know um, there's a and it's kind of what I would be shared in the table as well. And so there's a top down dictatorial approach versus participative, rigid versus flex, flex relaxed, cold versus caring, disjointed versus integrated. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's number focus versus quality focused, hierarchical versus being flat, micromanaged versus being autonomous, uh, reactive versus being proactive. Uh, secretive versus being honest, relationship versus saving versus telling the truth. Yeah, that's telling the truth is important. Uh, uh, indifferent versus letting people be curious, trust creating versus trust destroying. So you can just contrast, you know, uh, different um, elements and contrasting elements in an organizational culture. So what we must do, and again, just giving a very quick overview here is how do we move organizations from being good to great now this is general management stuff it's not you know not necessarily biblical but or bible but general management you know it's good 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 to know uh, how do we move uh, if an organization is good how can it become great how can it be excellent you know um and uh, jim collins was uh, uh, you know you know many would say a leadership or a management uh, guru in, in the secular world. He's written the book, Go to Great, and this is just a quick outline from that. Um, you encourage curiosity. I mean, let people be curious, let them ask questions, let them explore new things. <coughs> Sorry. So then it's you're creating an environment where people can, you know, be free to be creative, come out with new things, try things that are different rather than just following a set pattern. Uh, we are rigorous, but not ruthless. That means, yeah, we put in a lot of effort. We want to be good, excellent, precise, so on. So there is a rigor in our work, but not being you know, ruthless where we don't care about the people. Uh, in an organization that's great, there's a culture of discipline. People are disciplined. They think in a disciplined manner. They act in a disciplined manner. You know, so that means they're staying aligned, they're staying focused. While there is room for being curious, there's also this whole thing of discipline. It's not wasteful, it's not random, it's not purposeless. There is purpose and discipline in everything that's being done. Uh, leadership walks in humility. Uh, people are determined. Uh, they're not slack, they're not you know, just doing things. Um, for the sake of doing, they are working with determination, pushing past challenges and obstacles. Uh, you have the right people in the right jobs. Uh, people have unwavering faith in what can be done as an organization. Uh, they are honest and about facts and reality. I mean, you're not living in denial. It's like, okay, look, this is the way this is where things are, and this is where we need to go. Now, they are willing to pull themselves up in areas where they are slacking, lacking. Uh, address matters that need to be addressed. Uh, they are willing to use uh, technology uh, to help in the whole process. Uh, they have well-defined core values that they adhere to. Uh, they uh, understand differentiating competencies. Um, that is what we are good at doing, rather than trying to do everything. This is what we are good at doing. Let's do that. Uh, and uh, they understand the economic drivers, the monetary side, uh, things that are, again, important. Uh, focused passion, uh, goal-based goals that are based on understanding rather than just, uh, you know, uh, that look great. No, this, the goals are realistic. And uh, executive decisions, leadership decisions are based on dialogue and they're open to, you know, and now looking at things and reviewing things critically and revising and making corrections, right? So these are some things, and, and this is from a general business point of view, but you know, are, these are things we can take and say, hey, for us to be a great organization, these are things that we must uh, try and you know, uh, inculcate in our culture 
as an organization and uh, see if we can have them uh, at work right so let me pause here and see if there are any thoughts we're going to next talk about you know how do you evaluate the culture how do you assess it and uh, let me see if there are any questions any questions so far healthy culture versus a toxic organizational culture you see um, the problem or the uh, let me say the problem in christian churches and ministries is we we just assume that everything is going to be good kingdom culture but the fact is people are working together of course we are all godly people in the sense we all love god but that doesn't mean that the culture automatically becomes kingdom culture right we in fact the opposite is true that in many churches or christian organizations the culture has become very toxic simply because we have certain ideas like you cannot question the spiritual leader they won't ask any questions the way things are are the way it should be we can't make it better and so on and so forth or don't you know don't discuss things don't question what's happening don't point out faults you know all those kinds of wrong notions we carry when we work in a christian organization and those are the very things that prevent us from creating a healthy culture rather we are in a christian organization we live by godly values but we must be open to asking questions we must be open to saying something is wrong let's correct it uh, we must be open to saying you know if the leader is not doing what is right hey you need to address it uh, it has to be addressed you can't just keep quiet um all it all of course has to be done in a proper way but these are things you know, if we start doing inside the church organization or the christian organization you know we can have a good healthy culture and that's what i want to challenge us with All right. Say, go ahead, please. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment and observation. I, I, I think one of the reasons why we've had um, many, you know, church organizations having a very dogmatic way approach to things, such that members can't question when they are concerned. I think it's sometimes the insecurity. Uh, as leaders, what we face. And then on the other hand is that they haven't cultured or taught the members on how to give feedback in such a way that it doesn't cause any commotion or mm. division. So I, I think that's another area. I think how we can, you know, help our members open up in such a way that it's not going to cause division rather going to strengthen our convictions and if possible also change some things to align with scripture i think that's one area and then leaders then dealing with the insecurities of themselves because they feel that if something changes it looks like they're giving power to the church and the leader is no longer in control so dealing with such insecurity early helps you know when we come face to face with um, confrontations or not necessarily confrontations maybe basically concerns from members when they point out stuff that don't really really align or maybe they're confused or they don't think it aligns with scriptures i just mm. thought I'd make that comment and observation thank you mm. pastor mm. yep very good very good so both those insights are very true right so one is from the leadership side um the leadership should feel secure in letting and receiving feedback and welcoming feedback and encouraging feedback and not like overreacting when they are questioned or an idea that they have is challenged and so then people feel okay yeah it's okay to ask uh, point out some problem whatever it's okay and secondly i think as leaders um we need to know that uh, the more we empower people, 
the greater their sense of belonging to everything that's happening. And so even we as leaders have to have a mindset change, dealing with our insecurity and dealing with our openness for feedback. And then um, you have the second point, which is very valid, is to create a very a means by which people can give feedback without being afraid uh, in a very healthy, constructive way. Right? Uh, so some of the things that we, and I, I'm not sure if I even put it in the notes, I think I'm going to add it to the notes because of your comments. Um, uh, some of the ways we practice this, or we've tried to practice it, is one is, uh, we have an email ID. It's it's very simple. It's called feedback at apcw.org, uh, and every Sunday it comes up on the screen where we in, in our announcements uh, in all our locations, and we're telling people, hey, you know, we welcome your feedback. Send it to this. So very simple. Then you know, anybody wants to give feedback about anything in in church, they're welcome to send it. Now sometimes. Uh, it is very harsh, <laughs> some feedback. And some feedback is, you know, a very uh, objective. If there's something they've observed and, you know, we, so regardless of what the feedback is, we don't retaliate. You know, we give it the merit it deserves. And then, and it's usually me answering back, writing back to that, unless it's something very specific, say to worship or some other area of ministry, then the leader in that area will respond to that. But uh, we've tried to always be, you know, respond very politely and accept what they're saying. And then, then for ideas that we can implement, uh, we've, t you know, shown that we will take those ideas and do it, you know. So then people have that sense of, yeah, I can, I can talk, I can share, and so on. And then and the other thing also is uh, more event-based, meaning when we have workshops, seminars, Usually at the end of it, we give a piece of paper and say, hey, this is completely anonymous. Just tell us what you think and give us ideas. So when we usually when we have a conference, uh, write a blank piece of paper and we just two questions. You know, what did you like about this and what can we do better? So people, anyone can write anything, give it back to us and we review it and then we get ideas from it. We correct ourselves. Yeah, so, uh, so both, both these things are things we have been practicing over several years now and uh, I'm not saying it's you know fully changed the mindset of people but it's let people know that uh, they can express you know and then uh, the other I think the last thing I would say is in personal interactions uh, whenever we interact with people personally we uh, we listen to their what they have to say you know? we try to do that and say hey please tell us uh, because only then we can improve. So I think overall, just practicing these three things over time helps to some degree in letting the people feel comfortable, you know, giving feedback. So yeah, both your points are very, very valid. Thanks for sharing. Anyone Fantastic. else? Anyone else? Yeah, anything to? Okay. So. Let's go forward now with the next thing in, in relation to culture. I'm moving a little fast because uh, uh, I, we have only two more weeks of classes and I need to cover a lot of ground. Um, I mean, we can talk on each of these topics for, for a long time. I mean, the, all these topics are exciting uh, and very important, but uh, uh, we just have to move fast and because there's a lot of other things I want to finish. So how can we evaluate the culture of the organization? So we said, you know, look, there's healthy, there's toxic. How can you keep an eye on it, keep a pulse on it? So uh, we can do general assessment, you know, just, just talk to people, or you can do it in a written assessment, you know, uh, and ask these kinds of questions. These are the sample questions, you know, uh, that we can look, use to just evaluate ourselves. You know, what stories, experiences, the people remember about the organization. So generally when you talk to people, hey, what do you what, what do you really like about? It? What do you remember? What are your experience? What is your experience here? You listen to that. What do you think about the leadership? See, like we said, leadership is very important in creating that culture. So we start there. You know, what what do you think about leadership? What are the outstanding traits or what do you say about that? 
and then you see listen to what they're saying you know if they're saying well he's very strong he's very powerful he's very commanding or he or she whatever you know then then you know that something is not right and you know, that's not the kind of thing you want to hear all the time you know uh, what are the practices what are people excited about within the organization um how do people behave you know uh just how do people relate to each other? Is this, are this the openness? Are they friendly? Are they supportive? Are they sharing? Is there a sense of team spirit? Are people sacrificial? Are they fearless? Do they Are they open to give feedback to each other? So these are all good things. The opposite of these will indicate an unhealthy, toxic culture. Right? How do people who are in the organization, how do they feel about the organization? Are they happy? Are they excited? Uh, do they, you know, do they feel good or do they feel like, man, this is ter tough, you know, I'm suffocated, I, uh, you know, whatever, the negative things. So just asking people about that. Um, are people inward looking and outward focused? Are they thinking more about themselves and their job? Or they are look like, hey, I enjoy it. I want to help everybody else here. You know, we are, we are a team. Uh, their success is my success. If they win, I win. They're outward focused. Right? Uh, are people risk? Do the people feel the freedom, you know, to take risks, be entrepreneurial, be innovative, uh, or they just are very, very cautious? They feel like, oh, if I do make a mistake, that will be the end of my, you know, life here. So what 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 do they do? And the organizational structure itself is it hierarchical, with a lot of control, or is it flat and free? So simple questions that we can use to evaluate and say, okay, this is where we are. Um, these are then, you know, of course, we can make changes based on that um so uh, i think i missed something a kingdom culture one minute um i was supposed to talk about Hmm. Okay. All right. I uh, page forty. Sorry, I um I didn't convert my notes properly. I missed two pages. Okay. So I'm going to share this, and then I will upload it um, after class today. Let me just share my Word document. Yeah. Okay. So sorry, my mistake. I I I didn't I didn't save these two pages as a PDF um, as part of the PDF, so I missed it. So last one is um, uh, we can use a questionnaire like this, uh, um, you know, and tell people to give feedback, anonymous feedback. Uh, to evaluate the culture of the organization. So in case you know, any of you are working in an organization and you want to do an assessment uh, of the organizational culture, one is, you know, you could ask all the questions that we did in earlier, uh, or you could create a questionnaire like this and tell people to, you know, rate it, you know. So uh, various on various areas, um, how do you rate the organization and you can see if you know where where is the organization and is it you know in, in many of these areas and of course you could add add to this okay this is just a sample that i found i thought it was, it was nice and useful the last thing i want to cover here in the in the in the um, talking about organization culture is that ultimately for us because we're a Christian organization, our, our goal is to nurture kingdom culture. You know, all, all this while we're talking about general, general things, which could apply to, you know, even a, a, a secular organization or a professional organization. But in, the, in our Christian organization, our goal is to nurture kingdom culture. Right? So, so then we need to un define what is kingdom culture? And then how do we nurture it and how do we protect it? And so that's what I want to do in this last page here. So when we talk about kingdom culture, and I'm sure all of us know this, I'm just 
put it down as a list you know how how is kingdom culture expressed there is compassion love there's faith and courage there is humility servanthood there is sacrifice there is generosity there is hard work and you know we can give chapter and verse for all of these there's perseverance endurance uh, there is pioneering innovation creativity there's also stewardship fruitfulness that means we are looking to see that look there is we are being productive there is unity teamwork there is integrity honesty and everything is to glorify god so these are the expressions of kingdom culture here so this is what we have to foster and you see you can see that this kind of overlaps so much with what we have already been talking about in general terms you know um, uh, and but it's even from a, from a biblical perspective from a kingdom perspective these are all very valid so this is what we should be having inside the organization or in the congregation you know so we must nurture these traits so reiterate these say, hey hey guys you know we're talking to your staff or your people look this is what we need to have this is kingdom culture right so reaffirm remind people talk about it very important as leaders we have to model these traits now we can't tell people you do it but i i won't do it no it starts with us as leaders we must model it then others will follow it right? and then we have to rec require this that means at some times we need to correct people and say hey what you're doing is wrong it's got to be done like this this is you know this is kingdom culture you know, so that means we're not only affirming it to them but we are requiring it holding people accountable for expressing kingdom culture within the organization and lastly another way to nurture it as we have learned earlier is to recognize and reward these traits you know so hey somebody did an outstanding job they took a risk they came up with a brilliant idea you know that got it inspired in their hearts they went out and did it and here's the result you know so celebrate that or hey here was somebody who just served very quietly uh, like you know just in behind the scenes but they served so faithfully and that's why you know these six other people were able to do their work so you recognize and reward that person who was just in humility and servanthood serving in the background so you're celebrating the expressions or the outstanding expressions of all of these so then people you know say oh yeah that's 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 being celebrated that's what we should all uh, embody within the organization so you're nurturing this within the organization and then last point here is we need to protect this right so we it goes back to hiring when you hire uh, bring in people as staff make sure that um, there's a cultural fit uh, you do things to preserve the organization's traditions uh, sometimes you know some of the ways i i try to do it is i, I like try to write it down put it in books and so on these little stories here and there um, or within the organization in in you know uh, share it with the people uh, so that it's there so you know 20 years from now people come in they read those books or they listen to those sermons or they talk to people who are working right now have grown in the organization they will hear those you know traditions or stories or things that have shaped us as an organization over time it's god used um, you know encourage communication and it's nice if there's you know internal language that people use and they understand what it means um, re recognize reward behavior address matters that are contrary hold people accountable and avoid covering up right so don't cover up uh, let people know covering up is not a good thing but we need to address it and uh, and if there's toxic behavior we need to deal with it not feed into it right so the culture has to be protected so I'll, I'll share these two pages I, I missed including them in all right so let's pause here any questions before we the next lesson is on finance accounting money matters so before we shift topics any questions on culture thoughts on culture
Okay. So let's proceed now to the next topic that we have, uh, which is um, lesson 11. Um, let me share the PDF. Which is about money. Um, and of course, this is not a complete course on accounting or anything, but accounting or budgeting. It's it's just to show us that this is important and share a few tips and thoughts on that. So finance, managing money within the Christian organization is a big thing, right? And, um, you know, uh, this is very important because churches and organizations who have been doing very well, sometimes they just collapse uh, or they are put into a bad light completely. Not because of some big, you know, sin or thing that people did, but because they failed to manage the money properly. Something went wrong, you know. They, they didn't comply to the rules or money was mishandled, misappropriated, and so on. And then, you know, uh, we can see in even recent history, you know, so many organizations have misused uh, money that was given to them in good faith by people in the congregation or by other people who uh, supported them you know and, and and so it's uh it's it's so so important and i do want to say that you know this is an area of trust that you build with people that means why should people give money to in the church to the church or to the christian organization first people of course they want to you know, serve the purpose of God with their money. So they, they want to give everyone, you know, they want to honor God with their money. So they want to give. But why should they give to that particular church or to that particular Christian organization? Now, of course, oh, the wrong reason is they feel controlled by the pastor or the organization, so they feel obligated to give. That's the wrong reason. That's, that's not a healthy thing. But if that is put aside, then people give because they want to honor God. And secondly, they believe or trust in that the work being done in that church or in that Christian ministry. There is trust that has been earned. And that is so, so important. That is so important. You know, if when you earn the trust of people, it is it'll just make them feel so comfortable in. In, in giving money, you know, and uh, and and I've seen, you know, I've seen in, in real life how uh, people give into the work we are doing simply because they trust, you know, they 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 know that we are doing our best uh, to to handle our money uh, properly, to be transparent, uh, to be, you know. To do everything right, and so they they give to us. You know, just last week, uh, yeah, last week, the beginning of the week, I received a message uh, from from a person, and this lady d is not even attending our church right now. I mean, she used to attend, then you know, now they they moved to another part of our country, and so. Um, um, she called, uh, she messaged, then she called, and then she said, you know, I want to, you know, give uh, 50 lakhs, that is 5 million Indian rupees, and I want to give it to APC. Uh, can you please tell me, you know, what are the areas I can give to? And then she made the statement. She said, you know, uh, it's so difficult to find, and th these are her words, all right? I'm not, I'm not using this to promote, us, but these are her words. Uh, she said, you know, it's so difficult to find a genuine Christian ministry today. 
And I thought, I will give to ABC. Now, she doesn't even attend our church. And she said, I want to send 5 million, or that's 50 lakhs rupees. So then I just sent her an email saying, look, you know, here are all the areas you want to give. It's up to you. Then next same day, she sent the money. And, um, you know, so it's, it was just something simple. But, it, you know, I just looked to God and said, God, thank you for giving us this kind of trust with people. You know, that they would trust us so much that they would say, hey, I want to give, and I want to give to what's happening here at uh, you know at APC. And, and, and this person has been giving a lot over the years. But this particular time, she called. She, she said this, and that's, she said, I want to give. So the trust that we earn with people is so valuable, is so important that, uh, you know, when we do our finance and accounting and budgeting, just do your job, do it well, people will see it and they will open up and give. You know, we don't even have, that itself is a great, what to say, uh, a promotion. You don't have to beg and pull and no, no. The fact that you're doing things well itself is a big uh, reason why people will trust and give. So from a biblical perspective, we understand these things that, you know, we, we share a God-given vision. God will stir people up to give towards that vision. And, 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 and this is kind of one of the important ways in which we operate. We don't go begging people, you know, just once or twice. Talk about the, some particular vision of whatever work you're going to do. Say, look, this is what you're going to do. You know, and God will stir up the hearts of people to give into that vision. A second principle is we serve people spiritually and they will give to us financially. That's a biblical principle, right? So be faithful in serving people spiritually. You just serve spiritually. Don't worry about the money. Don't think, okay, I will serve this person better because they can give more and I will serve this person less because they can't give so much. No, we should not have that. Serve everybody spiritually equally, fairly, just serve them. And let God move on their hearts. They will sow. They will sow. If they've been blessed, they've been ministered to, they will sow financially. You don't worry about it. Right? A third principle is that we must be a good steward of money along with spiritual things. Just as we you know, make sure that we teach good doctrine, we are careful with the spiritual things that we Minister, administer to, to people. We should also be careful with how we handle money that they entrust us with. Fourth principle is be accountable to the people who have given. So let them know of what is happening. So the way we do it is uh, right from the very beginning, from 2001, uh, we publish on our church website. We have a page. Um, it's apcworg slash finances. On that page, we publish our annual audited statements. So these are the final, you know, after all the audit is done and the accountants have signed off and everything has been checked and approved, the summary of that is published on our website. So anybody can go in and see how the church is doing financially from 2001 till current, you know, every, every audited year, finances go up. So we're saying, we're telling the people, we are accountable. And if you have any questions, you can ask, you send an email to accounts at apcw.org. If you want to come and see, any member of the church can come and see our accounts. So we make that open. And then we also provide reports. Uh, we didn't do it, of course, during the pandemic because a lot of activity was stopped. But at the end of each year, so till 2019, 2020, 2021, we didn't do this, but 2022, we will do it is at the end of each year, we send a year in review report where we tell people how much money has been spent in different areas. Now, whether they actually go in and study all of that doesn't matter. But it's us telling the people, we are accountable. We are telling you this is where your money went in the course of this calendar year. You know, So that's another form of accountability that we practice. And the last principle is the Bible teaches us to be accountable to civic authority. So that means, uh, you know, all the statutory filings uh, that need to be done have to be done. 
Otherwise, we will get into trouble with the civic authorities. They will come and say, hey, you haven't done this, or you miss you know, money is being misallocated or misused, and we get into trouble, and it will be a big problem. So follow the rules, follow the laws, and be accountable. Do whatever filings have to be done. So if we follow these five key principles and how we manage the money, we, should, we will be safe and good. And we can have that trust that people, which will then cause people to give to us. OK? Let me pause here. We'll go for a break. Um, and uh, um, any questions so far on just this introduction on finances? OK. Let's um, let's go for a quick 10-minute break. Uh, we'll be back, and we will continue. Thank you. <laughs> 